dig on okay. how we dig for time. Okay, so with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Yuja to this week's Arrow Theory Seminar. Yuja is a final year PhD student at Stanford with Aaron Sitford. And she's also spent some time with the learning theory team at Google Research. Her research interests include designing efficient sublinear or linear time algorithms for large scale and foundational tasks in machine learning and reinforcement learning. And today she'll be speaking to us about optimal regret in model free RL with nonlinear function approximation. So with that, Yuja, please do get us started. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And it is great to be back at RL Theory Seminar again. Uh, it has been over a year, and it is great to see this nice event being held regularly again. So my name is Yuzia, and today I'll be introducing my recent work with Alec and Tom on this new algorithm called Vocal, which we designed to achieve the optimal regret for model-free reinforcement learning under nonlinear function approximation. So today's talk will be divided into three parts. First, I'll briefly introduce the problem we study and the main results we achieve, and comparing it with some prior works in literature. Then I will explain a few technical components in our work, which allows us to achieve the result. And finally, I will discuss some open problems that would be interesting to look into in future. Feel free to interrupt me anytime throughout the talk if you find any questions. So first of all, let's motivate our problem a little bit. So there are numerous challenges in designing data and computation efficient methods for reinforcement learning, especially for efficient exploration. Here we list some of the main challenges. The first one is usually in online learning setting, the agent could only receive a sparse feedback. This is pretty common, say we are running on an agent to drive the car. If we only care about the safely arriving at the final destination or not, the reward is extremely sparse and the long trajectory leading to the success appears pretty challenging to learn. Similarly, if we consider playing chess, which has a final outcome of either win or loss, the reward is also sparse and challenging to learn. Additionally, another common challenge for reinforcement learning is the highly complex nature of the value functions. Especially, people nowadays use neural networks to encode value functions, which can be fairly complex and thus have wide expressibility. Additionally, imagine we are playing a maze game then the value function is also based on the geometry of each path, which could appear pretty arbitrary. So people have made numerous attempts to better address these challenges. For instance, in the sparse reward setting, when summation of rewards at all rounds is bounded by one, people proposed new algorithms with horizon-free regret bounds in the tabular setting and for linear mixture MDPs. People have also derived more fine-grained instance-dependent regret bounds depending only on the size of the optimal value function, which is known as first-order regret algorithms. So for complex RL structures, people propose different types of general models to study, including linear MDP, low-rank MDP, general function approximation under various assumptions, and palm DPs, etc. In this particular work, we asked the question of how to obtain your optimal regret bounds under general function approximation for RL with sparse feedback. And can we achieve the near optimal regret in this particular setting, tackling both challenges together? Okay, so now please allow me to introduce some notations. We consider a time inhomogeneous episodic MDP setting where we denote the MVP as usual by M, which is composed of the state space X, action space A, the probability transition, which we allow to be different for all the levels H, and the reward function RH for each level H. Sometimes we write the shorthand Z for the state action pair for simplicity. We consider the sparse reward setting, meaning the sum of rewards at all rounds is bounded by one under any policy we are going to take. We also follow the standard transition and use V star H and Q star H to denote the H level optimal V value and Q value function respectively. 
In this notation, the Bellman equation can consequently be expressed as this relationship between Q star H and B star H plus 1. We use Cal T to denote this Bellman operator. We will also consider assumptions including completeness and bounded general eluder dimension, which we will explain in more detail shortly. So the main result of our paper is a new algorithm, which we call VOCO, that achieves improved regret bonds for both linear MDPs and general function class. In particular, the leading order of our regret bond for linear MDP scales as d times square root ht, which improves previous works like LSBI, UCB, and Elena, which has higher poly dependence on d or h factors. This bound also matches the provable lower bound asymptotically. For general function class, our algorithm achieves a regret bound of square root d times log of f times h and t. Here, d is the complexity of the function class in terms of some generalized eluder dimension that we define, which we will explain shortly. Log f is the common log covering size of the function class. So this regret bound improves over previous algorithms proposed for the same setting in terms of the dependence on the eluder dimension, horizon length h, and also removing the log covering dependence of the state action space. Finally, it is worth mentioning that um, it is worth mentioning that here the square root h term is unimprovable uh, since we consider the inhomogeneous model. How to obtain the real horizon-free dependence for homogeneous model is an interesting future work problem. So a concurrent work of ours also obtained the same leading order near optimal dependence for linear MDPs, and their approach combines weighted regression, which we also use in our work, and the different rare switching arguments to reduce the complexity of targeted function class. If you're interested, please also feel free to check out their work. So in order to achieve the claimed regret bounds, we need to make the following two assumptions. The first assumption is what we call realizability under the Bellman backups. This is a stronger notion than completeness. In particular, for any V function mapping to 0, 1, we want to make sure that there exists some function in the function class that is reasonable close to the Bellman operator applied to this function B. Hey, Yuja. So yeah. Johannes has a quick question. Johannes would like to know whether T is the number of interactions or the number of episodes. T is the number of episodes. And I think Chaba also has a question. Chaba, do you want to go ahead? That was the same. Ah, okay. Thanks, okay, Yuja. so T is, the, yeah, T is the number of trajectories or episodes, and um, it is sometimes also denoted as k, I guess. In this work, we denote it as t, and h is the number of levels in number of rounds in each trajectory. OK, I hope that uh, explains it. OK, so this is the first assumption we make on realizability under Bellman backups. And the second assumption is the bounded complexity of function class. So we consider this generalized notion of the standard eluder dimension. This dimension for class F is defined as the supremum of this quantity, which we denote as dimension F Z sigma. Uh, this uh, quantity for each sequence of Z and variant sequence sigma measures essentially the summation of this fractional numbers truncated at one, which essentially tells how different any two functions can be at the new point, given function arrows in all previous points are relatively uh, small. So note the crucial thing here is that these differences are going to be reweighted by the F variant sequence sigma. And when we are taking the supremium, we consider the supremium of variant sequence for all variants that are uh, larger element-wise than this alpha threshold. So in our results, our stated D is actually the average of the this dimensionality over the function class FH for all levels of H. And we are going to denote this fractional quantity by DF square Z sigma T, Z T minus one, sigma T minus one, which will appear a lot uh, when we analyze the regret bound of the algorithm. 
So just to explain these assumptions for a little bit more, uh, as common for all other so-called generalization of assumptions, we basically want to show that these assumptions are satisfied reasonably for the linear MDPs as a special case. So consider a linear MDP with non-feature mapping phi h. We know by definition that this probability transition and the expected reward can be expressed as linear functions of the feature with unknown coefficients. It turns out that we can write function class to be all linear function of phi h with this bounded coefficient of wh. So this is the function class we can write. And such a function class actually satisfies our assumption 1. We can also show that this function class has covering number od by taking just an epsilon net of this d-dimensional coefficient space. So this is how this assumption applies for the special case of linear MDPs. Similarly, for assumption 2, for linear MDPs, this essentially reduces to the ellipsoid potential lemma people have proven. For example, I think Chaba also has some work showing this lemma and show that how we can bounce this uh, growth of the potential for the linear MDP case. So we can show that for the function class we define for this linear MDP, the entire quantity sums up to O tilde D. And let's recall also the definition of standard eluder dimension, which I want to make a small comparison here. The standard eluder dimension is defined by the longest sequence of Z such that each individual uh, element in the sequence is going to be epsilon independent of the predecessors. So when we restrict all the variance sigma to be equivalent to one always in our definition, then we can show that our eluder dimension is going to be bounded by the standard eluder dimension up to a constant additive term. So this essentially means that our notion of eluder dimension is a weaker assumption when restricting sigma equals to one. So if we know the assumption that the standard eluder dimension is bounded, then we can also show that our uh, eluder, general eluder dimension uh, condition when restricting sigma is also bounded. However, you, because, yes, we have another question from Chaba. Yes, there is a oh, uh, I see the lambda. Okay, so I I, I think I, I see. Uh, I was just parsing and then looking at the upper bound and see the lambda there, and I was looking for where is the lambda coming from, but. It's oh, coming yeah, yeah. that you so, have a fixed yeah. lambda in, yeah, in assumption two, right? Yeah, the lambda comes from in our definition. We consider this uh, lambda factor in the in the denominator. So the reason we consider that is, for example, when we are solving the regression problems, we are going to consider this plus some right. regularizer that has this lambda factor. Right. Right. So yeah. So basically, <clears throat> what we are saying is that when the epsilon of the of the standard eluder dimension is smaller than this uh, number of is on the order of this square root lambda over t so that the lambda in the denominator doesn't make a huge uh, effect to the actual quantity of our um, dimension definition then we are able to show that our general eluder dimension is going to be always smaller than the standard eluder dimension okay yeah, so because we're taking the supremum over all variance sequence sigma, so in fact, these two terms are not really comparable because if we consider a general sigma, then this quantity may still also be larger. Uh, for most of the examples, such as linear MDPs, we can show that this is essentially equivalent to what it is originally for the standard eluder dimension as well. Quick question from me: Is this in the previous tables where you showed uh, other results? Was this the same D you were showing for the other papers? Like, is this an existing concept or is this a new concept in your work? Uh, this D is defined under this new concept we have. Right. So the D for, for linear, previous work for linear MDP, the D is the same as the previous work, which is the, essentially the dimension of the feature mapping. But for general function class, we have to define this D is comes from this new notion of general eluder dimension. That's why I have parentheses here, because it is not really the 
a little bit of dimension in original work. Yeah. Thank you. How about you? No, wait, 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 wait. I think that it just like if you press space or whatnot, like uh, you show the previous works here on the same slide. Uh, Sorry, what is the question? Like, can can you show the previous works, like the results for previous works on the same? Yeah. Oh, like oh. One more. Oh. Well, there, there was no for the for the general case as well. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. that that one, the D to the three half and whatnot, the golf. So those elevator dimensions were using a different D elevator dimension than than yours, or they're using the standard elevator dimension definition. Okay, and they are incomparable. Uh, yes, I think in that uh, perspective, it is incomparable. So it's like, okay, so then it's not very clear whether you're improving on their work or not. Uh, yeah, I think if you are saying it that way i think it is unclear but yeah i also don't know what is the reasonable function class to look at for general function class besides sure. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so so but i agree with you like the belief is that for reasonable function class those two quantity would not maybe dif differ by a lot, but okay. I agree with you that like, if you just look at the definition, they are not really comparable. Like they are not like apple um, to apple. Yeah, but I'm specifically wondering about whether you try to show that they are incomparable as well, or so do we know that they're incomparable or we just don't know whether they are? I don't think we have lower, so I don't think we have I think I try to show they are comparable, but couldn't work. But I don't know. Like we have like lower bound, like of like hard instance function class where the our general elliptic dimension is strictly larger mm -hmm. by a non-trivial factor. And if it but was, it would know. it would just come because of the soup over the sigmas, right? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And you, got, you have one more question from Armand. Uh -huh, uh, yeah. Yes, just out of curiosity, if, uh, building on uh, Chaba's uh, point, indeed the three quantities that you have are not uh, comparable unless you are in a particular range. So my question is perhaps the inverse of Chaba's point, is that if I look at what you did in your work and let's say any one of the previous work, when your work is better, is that explainable in a kind of an intuitive way because of the relationship of D, H, and T with respect to each other? Sorry, in, other words, in other words, to put it differently, if I were to compare your work against the first previous statement that you have with the three and D to the three half, and let's assume that uh, D and H and T are in a range where you are better. Can I explain this intuitively or am I just in the fog and it's just the mathematics that leads me to this? I feel like for from my perspective, I feel like our definition is more like a way of simplifying, okay, like a way of simplifying things rather than actually like um, but yeah, actually, I'm not sure because the reason we are introducing sigma and supremum over all sigma is because in the analysis, we use weighted regression rather than the unweighted regression, which is used commonly in the previous work. So I actually don't really know on top of my head what, if we are able to reduce the, if we are able to work with the standard eluded dimension condition and still be able to get the same claim if we are, if we have a weighted regression framework. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay. it's a, uh, it's a that we can look a little bit into, I think. Yeah, I suspect we'll probably have a discussion about this right at the end as well. Chaba, do you still have a question? No, uh, I decided that it's going to be better to discuss yeah. that at the end. Yeah, let's discuss this uh, dimension in more detail at the end. Thanks, Yuja. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. So, yes, yeah, so 
it's a good point you made that this is not really a comparable measure compared with the standard diluted dimension motion. And okay, so basically this is a brief discussion about the assumptions we make. And next, let's see what kind of uh, algorithm we can propose working with those assumptions. So the main idea underlying our work, just to summarize on the very high level, is that we still want to build with, on the baseline model-free approach, which is the optimistic Q-learning algorithm framework. And the major difference from the classic optimistic Q-learning as I mentioned earlier, is that we're using a weighted regression together with fine-grained analysis of the bonus. So essentially, we show that the summation of the bonus will sum up to square root ht rather than h times square root t, saving a, a, a square root factor of h for our final regret bound. And additionally, in order to be able to do this weighted regression in a reasonable way, we also need to maintain the monotonicity of optimistic estimates that we construct of uh, the true value function. So this is a very crucial property we need in our framework in order to come up with a fixed variance estimate, even for the future targets. So as I explain the algorithm, you'll be able to see what I mean by fixing the variance estimates for future targets. So to begin with, let's just recap a little bit the classic optimistic Q-learning setting. So it works as uh, taking different uh, exploration trajectories at every step, which we denote by T. And then in every step, there is a fitting step, a fitting part to it and an exploration part to it. So in the fitting part, what we are essentially going to do, as this may appear very familiar to a lot of you, is that we go backward and try to construct a better optimistic estimate of the true value function. And the classic way we are going to do this is that we are going to solve this f hat at th using an unweighted regression on the past data and consider the target function of fth plus 1, which we can in the previous iteration. And then we're going to compute the bonus term, which we denote by BTH, and then update the optimistic value function to be this f hat th, which is the solution to the unweighted regression problem, plus this new bonus we compute, which is BTH. And then we're going to, this FTH is basically the Q optimistic value function we construct. And we're going to take the maximum over the action space to construct the corresponding V value. So this is what we do in the fitting step from all the way back at uh, level H to level one. And then in the exploration step, what we are going to do is essentially explore making use of this new optimistic value function we construct. So we are going to take greedy policy pi t according to FTH and then explore the new state action pair following the model transition and the policy pi t. So this is going to be uh, the entire framework of the classic optimistic Q-learning. So the main thing we want to add here is that we want to use weighted regression. And how do we have a weighted regression framework that fits into the original optimistic Q-learning? So in our algorithm, which we call VOCO, we are going to change the fitting step for a little bit. So we still go from the backward, but when we are solving f hat th, we are going to use this weighted regression fitting on the past data with a target function fth plus one, still the same target function that we compute in the previous level. And then we will need to use this variance estimate sigma sh, where we need to estimate sigma sh properly so that it is going to be larger than the variance. Okay, sorry, I think there is a square missing here. We need to make sure the variance, the square of the sigma sh quantity is going to be larger than the variance, conditional variance, conditioning at the current state's action pair zsh on using the future target of FTH plus one. So this is the property we need to guarantee for our estimate variance. And then 
with this uh, solution I've had for the weighted regression problem, we can compute the bonus through a more fine-grained oracle, which also needs to take into the variance estimate sigma SH in the oracle. And then similarly, we can just update the function FTH equals to F hat TH plus BTH and compute the V value correspondingly of the Q value. That's so a quick question. The sigma you've got here, it doesn't seem to depend on T. So does this need to be an upper bound for all possible F that you could have on the right hand side? Yeah, that's a very great question. That is essentially what I mean when I talk about the key ideas, the second line of it. So that means we need to fix a variance estimate, which remains a valid upper bound for all the future targets. And I think you're essentially two steps ahead of me. I'm trying to give this general framework and talk about the problems and talk about our solutions. But this is essentially the second problem and the solution we are going to talk about. Cool. So yeah, so this is the essential framework, but there are a few issues with it. So the first question that we naturally wonder is how are we going to actually estimate this variance estimate sigma SH for the step S and H? So let's first think about when T equals to S, how we are going to estimate a valid variance upper bound. So one way we can naturally do is by noting that the variance can be expressed as the, uh, the variance can be written equivalently as the expectation of this uh, second order term minus the expected condition, a uh, conditional expectation to raise to the power of two. So what we can do is that we can estimate each component respectively. So for the second term, we already have f hat th, which is kind of expressing this conditional expectation. So we essentially only need the first term, which we are going to fit by solving an unweighted regression problem with this uh, second order term. So essentially here, we need to introduce another function g hat, which comes from solving this unweighted regression problem on the past data and the target function fth plus one with uh, this uh, second order term so that the solution we get is on, in expectation approximately uh, show, uh, uh, approximating this expect conditional expectation of the second order term. So, and then when we are computing and have the observation of state action pair in our current expectation, in our current exploration, then what we can do is that we can essentially estimate the variance to be on the order, to be the difference of these two terms, where the first term is going to be g hat th, and the second term is going to be f hat th squared, all evaluated at the current state action pair we explore. So this is only approximately true because in the actual computation of the variance term, we also need to add various bonus terms to make sure that with high probability, the quantity is larger than the second order conditional expectation and the uh, quadratic term of the conditional expectation that we compute. But roughly, we are basically using the information of f hat t and g hat t to estimate the variance at the current step t. So this is what we are going to do. But as Dave has asked earlier, this next question we naturally have is that we need to pick an variance estimation for the current step t, and it is going to be fixed once we have chosen the estimate. However, the target function is going to be changing over the iterations t. So the question is that, how do we come up with a variance estimate that can be a valid upper bound for all the future targets. So this is actually a bigger challenge for the design of our algorithm. And we make the following observations. So we hope that the variance we are able to construct is an upper bound for this quantity where the function is FTH rather than FSH that may be true for all the future iterations T larger than S. And the first observation we make is that if we know for some reason that the 
uh, the optimistic that Q function FSH is going to be monotonic. So that the next round's Fs plus one H is going to be pointwise no larger than the previous rounds of FSH. Then we are naturally okay because the target function changes in a monotonic way. Then we can consider ways that where we estimate sigma SH using the current target function and it still holds valid for the future target function. However, in general, they may not be monotonic. And even if we want to make them monotonic by taking the minimum over the previous function, it will necessarily increase the complexity of the function class, which will lead to additional poly T factors in the final regret. So the main solution we propose is to introduce two other overly optimistic and pessimistic functions, f which we denote by f as 2h and f as minus 2h, and then this fth is going to be ft1h. And essentially, the invariance we are able to maintain is that the overly pessimistic function f as minus 2 is going to be pointwise smaller than the true optimal value function, and it's going to be pointwise smaller than the original optimistic function we estimate through weighted regression, which we call ft1, and pointwise smaller by fs2h, which is the overly optimistic function. And this has to hold true for all state action pairs and also for any s smaller than t. So now, essentially, what we are going to do for fitting the function for fitting the variance estimate is that we want to use the overly optimistic and pessimistic functions. For example, when we are fitting the conditional second order term, we are going to use the FT2 instead of FT1, which uh, actually satisfy the quantity that it is going to be remain the valid upper bound even for future iterations too. And Using this new way of defining G hat, uh, yes, is there a question? Yeah, it's it's for me. Uh, so just reading this line in the blue, uh, fitting uh, G hat uh, T H. After the bracket, I see this F T two oh, H oh. plus one. What, what is that? Yeah, it is a tempo, I think. There is nothing. Okay. You you should just that's what I saw. That I was just like not sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it, I was a little bit. Yeah, this is just a tempo. Okay. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah, so G hat TH is just fitting the expected conditional expectation of the second order term. And in the exploration step, when we are estimating the variance, we're going to set variance to be approximately this G hat at TH at the current observation minus the F hat T minus two ZTH uh, square. So remember that we have said that f hat t minus 2 is going to be a valid lower bound for the actual ft1. So this also remains a valid uh, lower bound for uh, the expect conditional expectation square that we are trying to estimate so that when subtracting it, our variance estimate is a valid upper bound. Yes. Is there a new question? Yeah. Uh, so this very... It, it, it strongly exploits that the rewards are between zero and one, or like no negative at least, right? The no negativity of the rewards is, is used in these monotonicity conditions. Yes. So I if, think... if someone starts with some other rewards and you don't have it, then I don't know. Maybe it's not that I thought. Is. I thought the reward is can be made zero one without loss of generality yeah i'm like if you know the range then sure you can <laughs> shift things yeah but what if uh someone just says that oh i designed the reward here it is it comes from black box okay it's a really good question but um, mm, i see that's an interesting point i still think i still think you should be easy to estimate the range of two constant facts um uh, uh, okay i guess you're saying if you haven't seen it then yeah i see 
you have this sparsely what you always see a zero you never know whether you're gonna see <laughs> zero is a good thing or the bad thing or what is I see, I see i see i think i think you yeah i need to double check you are probably right that we are exploiting the non-negativity of the reward okay. i don't know how, yeah I don't know on top of my head if it still holds if reward can be negative, but I can I can check it a little bit. Well, algebraically, it, it seems that that's the key, yeah, key yeah. thing. So just I... looking at this, all I think you need to do is lower bound the absolute value of the reward here on the right hand side. This just needs to be pessimistic for the absolute value, and then you're fine. So if you just let everything on absolute values, I think you could still do the same estimator. For variance. Maybe it would be too, like, they have to be careful about how much overestimation is happening with these sigmas, because otherwise, right? Like, I assume at one point in the analysis, you're going to be concerned about that the sigmas are too big. If the sigmas were way too big for being a valid estimate of the variance, I don't expect the argument. I mean, sigma is, is going to yeah, get sigma the same result. To, sigma on the order of constant is like a trivial bound, like, right? And then we essentially want sigma to be as fine grained as possible when we are estimating the variance upper estimate. So mm. another quick question: You've got these nice relations on the f's. Is there an intuitive relation between this g hat? And the Fs, is there a reason we should understand how this will relate to the variance of the weighted estimator? Oh, you're asking, sorry, you're asking what is the relation between G hat and sigma? Yeah, so now you're using the unweighted estimator to get a variance estimate, which you will then use in the weighted estimator. Now, if I recall correctly, what you wanted is an upper bound on the variance of the weighted estimator. Okay, yeah, that's a that's this an interesting. This is a bit recursive, and I don't immediately see how this works. Yeah, 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 that's an interesting question. I haven't got into that yet, but essentially, fs two and fs minus two and g all comes from unweighted regression, and only ft one comes from weighted regression. And only FT1 is the more fine-grained optimistic value function we are able to construct. And you okay. can show that when you are looking at the summation of the sigma's contribution to the final regret, they are essentially on some lower low order sense. So in the sense that when you are estimating the variance, it's OK if you estimate it from the value function that comes from unweighted regression rather than coming directly from weighted regression. So I agree, like if you use weighted regression, then you have better estimate of G and F, for example, and then you have better estimate of variance. But if you look at the regret analysis for getting the leading order correct, you don't really need to use that fine grained variance. Like you can afford to just use the uh, unweighted regressions estimate for estimating the variance. Yeah, so there is no like chicken and egg problem because when you're estimating the variance, you don't really need to know the variance. Perfect, thank you. If that makes sense. Yeah, no problem. And okay, so this is essentially the key thing to our algorithm. And then our algorithm, the final algorithm structure of our algorithm is essentially that we are going to compute estimate this f hat t1, which is the most fine grained optimistic value we construct using the weighted regression and the target function of ft1 in the next round in the next level and then we also use unweighted regression to compute f hat t plus two and minus two which are essentially the overly optimistic and pessimistic functions we want to construct which is using the same past data but the target function of ft2 and ft minus two in the next um, level and then after fitting this unweighted regression, we also compute the standard bonus term and construct the overly optimistic value and overly pessimistic value by adding and subtracting the st standard bonus term. So 
if just uh, making an analogy to the previous like classic optimistic Q learning algorithm, you can treat this FT2, which comes from unweighted regression and be an optimistic value for the true value function. The original, uh, the original Q optimistic Q learning algorithm is essentially only constructing this FT2. While what we do is that we not only need FT2, but also FT minus two and also FT1, which is a more fine grained optimistic Q value. And then we are also going to solve this G hat T, which essentially uh, approximate the expected second order term, also using unweighted regression and use the target function of FT2 rather than FT1. So we want to estimate the second order term for the overly optimistic function F rather than the fine grained optimistic function in order for the variance to hold valid for future targets as well. Sorry, so could you just remind us what G, what this last quantity was in relation to everything else? G hat T. G hat T, uh, yes. G hat T is going to be the estimation of this for some target function FT. And here we use FT2 rather than FT1. I see. And that's different. Oh, and this is using the other G. OK, I see. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And OK. And this is because we want this to hold for future targets as well. So we are doing this design choice. And then, uh, OK. And then for this is for the fitting part. And for the exploration part, uh, we also need to take a new way of uh, way of defining policy for data exploration. According to FTH, the optimistic value functions we constructed, but not only for FT1H, but also for FT2H. So we have this fine-grained optimistic function FT1H and also a more crude optimistic value function of FT2H. And in our exploration, it turns out that it's, it doesn't suffice for us to only explore using the fine-grained FT1 or just using the cruder FT2. We actually need to combine them both. So essentially, the way we are going to do this is that we first always starting from exploring, exploring new state using a greedy uh, policy regarding to FT1 edge. If FT1 edge is not too much smaller than FT2 edge. And if we have arrived at a certain state where FT1 edge is much smaller, the gap between FT1 edge and FT2 edge at the current step, uh, at the current state is going to be too large then we will switch to FT2 edge and only explore using FT2 edge in all the future uh, horizon like levels. Okay, so at a high level that makes sense, but what is X superscripted by H prime? What's subscripted by T comma two? Oh, oh sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a tipple. It's X T H prime. Sorry about that. X T, okay. And what does it mean to evaluate F H, a function that I presume is only defined on the partition of a state space that you can reach in H, evaluated at an X that I presume doesn't belong to that part of the state space, to H, X, H prime? Oh, yeah, that's an, so basically, if we are doing the original greedy exploration, we are essentially also doing that. So we define the bonus function and the optimistic function, okay, okay, sorry. So the bonus function is defined generically so that the optimistic function we have is also defined generically. And then when you explore, you do can look at the optimistic functions value at all the states possible that you reach rather than only the previous states that you use to fit the function. That's essentially the reason that we're fitting a function. Basically, we want to gather the information of particular points and then try to fit a function which is defined for all the state actions. Just a clarification question about this. Did you assume that the state space across all the stages of the problem are the same? Oh, uh, we assume that, yes. Okay, so that answers Dave's okay. question, I think. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Trevor, and thank oh, you, Trevor. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. That was a confusion. Okay. Okay. So this is the 
this is the data exploration policy. And then using this exploration policy, we can explore the new state and action pair, follow the model transition and the policy. And then at each obser new observation we draw, we are going to use the similar way as we mentioned before to estimate the variance using g hat th and f hat t minus 2h squared. Okay. And there are a few important things I want to remark about our data exploration policy. So basically the reason that we're using both FT1 and FT2 is that we want to ensure a safe exploration in the sense that we want to make sure that whenever FT2 is too far away than FT1, we are exploring according to FT2 rather than FT1. And the UT is essentially the, a threshold that we can control in our, our algorithm. You can treat it as the parameter that we can choose. And in the to obtain the optimal regret, we are going to pick UT to be on the order of poly DH over square root T. And finally, I just want to say that this policy is a non-Markovian policy. So in the sense that the exploration you are going to do at the current state depend on the entire trajectory rather than just depending on the current state. So this is not really Markovian. However, it is okay for all our regret analysis because we essentially only need our Martingale thing to evolve. So it doesn't matter whether we are using Markovian or non-Markovian, but this is an important difference from the previous work as well. And to confirm this UT itself is not data dependent? UT is not data dependent. We are going to pick a fixed UD for to run our algorithm. Doesn't depending on yeah. Uh, it is. It depends on the D and H. So like assuming we know D and H. Okay. So. Okay. So next, I'm going to explain a little bit how we prove this. Due to interest of time, I may need to go very fast, but we can revisit some of the details of this later. So basically, there are two key lemmas in our paper we are able to prove, which allows us to prove the final regret bonds. The first lemma, as I have mentioned earlier, is that we are able to maintain this invariance of F uh, overly pessimistic, smaller than true opt, smaller than optimistic, smaller than overly optimistic. And this is very particularly helpful for our estimate of the variance, because when we are actually defining the variance, we are going to set our variance term to be something like this, using the g hat as we compute and f hat s minus 2 at the current state that we explore plus some bonus terms to make sure that with high probability it's going to be larger than the true uh, targeted like Bellman, uh, Bellman operator applied to the future target that we are trying to estimate. And we can show that because we construct it in this way, this is essentially larger than this conditional expectation of the second order term for the overly optimistic function at the current uh, step S minus this conditional expectation of the overly pessimistic target function to the power of two. And because of this invariance, this inequality also implies that for all the future target, when we are considering the overly, sorry, not the overly, the optimistic fine grained value function we construct, this is also going to be larger than the conditional expectation of the second order term minus square of the conditional expectation where we are evaluating at the using our fine-grained optimistic function for future iterations t and because of these two facts the first fact essentially tells us this is going to be a valid variance upper bound that we want for the target function of fs1 because fs1 lies between the overly op pessimistic and overly optimistic for the current iteration and the second uh, inequality essentially tell us this is essentially the expression of the variance when we are evaluating at the new target function of FT1 for all the future iterations. So the variance we are able to set is also a valid upper bound for all the future, uh, for all the variance. Uh, 
using the future targets FT1. So this is one of the key things in the design of our algorithm. And the second thing is essentially the policy switching, like the very particular type of policy ex exploration that we have in the exploration step. So basically, we are able to show that we can divide all the trajectories into two types, where the good iterations are the iterations that we are only using FT1 in the exploration, and the bad iterations where are where we only not only use the fine-grained FT1, but also use the overly optimistic FT2 in the exploration, which is mainly due to the fact that we meet a state where the value of FT1 and FT2 differ a lot. So it turns out that how many good iterations and better iterations we have in the algorithm is essentially controlled between this threshold of UT. So essentially how much difference we can tolerate between FT1 and FT2. So in some sense, if we make this threshold to be very tiny, then the number of bad iterations is going to increase by a lot because it is very easy to break this threshold. On the other hand, if we make the threshold, this UT value difference between FT1 and FT2 to be very large, then usually FT1 and FT2 will be within this uh, difference range. And then we only very occasionally go with the bad iterations. So in particular, we need to do an optimal trade-off for choosing the right value of UT. So if we choose the UT to be on the order of one over square root T, then we are able to show that the summation of all these threshold UT is on the order of some poly DH times square root T. And also the total number of bad iterations is going to be bounded by uh, only a small fraction of the actual number of trajectories. So T prime size is going to be bounded by T over H. Okay, so and both these uh, quantities appear important to get the final optimal regret in our algorithm. Okay, so next, I originally prepared a bunch of algebra, but uh, I think due to interest of time, we may be able to save this to a uh, later discussion if people are really interested. So, but basically on the very high level, what we are doing is that we are able to show that the estimate we get are good estimates that are actually estimating the Bellman operator applied to the future target. And then they are relatively close to the Bellman operator applied to the future target up to this bonus term factor, where the bonus term is somewhat defined by the generalized eluder dimensions notion of df times some logarithmic covering factor times the variance. And similarly, for the overly optimistic and overly pessimistic, we also have a quantity of bonus that is uh, defined using the original bonus definition. And then we can essentially argue recursively to show that the regret bound is essentially bounded by the summation of the uh, first uh, fine grain type of bonus terms BT1 plus the summation of the cruder uh, bonus terms BT2 only on the bad iterations, which are like when T belongs to this T prime, where we did explore some uh, using some information of FT2. Yes. What's calligraphic B? Calligraphic B. Oh, B is the complexity size of the bonus class. So usually bonus is on a higher complexity size than the original function class. That's why we use a different notion to the notion. Why is it that you're just using one function class assuming completeness? That's kind of enough. Um, that is not the most fine grain. For example, in linear MDP, F is on the order of D, but B is on the order of D squared. Uh -huh. Because like when yeah. you consider, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I get it. It's the, okay. It's the different, but, like, 
Oh, I, I guess it's kind of interesting, but you never introduced it, so I, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I should have talked about this definition, but yeah. And what's it's the definition of that? It, it is like uh, the difference between two functions in the function class, or? It's essentially, so, so in our paper, we have a bonus oracle, and it's essentially all the possibility of that bonus oracle lies in this bonus function class. So it can be different for different function class, I guess. But for for the linear case, how would it look like? In the linear case, yeah. I think that's basically. Uh, let me recall. I think that's basically a quadratic, but I don't remember. Yeah, I think that's all kinds of quadratic, like apply to mm -hmm. uh, using different types of functions. And then you essentially show that all the possible PSD matrix is on the order of D square or something. Ooh, because when you're contracting the bonus, you're subtracting the function that you estimate is squared. So yeah. Because of that, you have the quadratic term. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes, kind yes. of the B thing. Yes, okay. yes, yes. All right. I was, yes. I was trying to think about where is the quadratics and I <laughs> from there. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, like our fine grained bonus term doesn't depend on this potential higher complexity. Only our cruder bonus term depends on this potential uh, complexity. So that is also important for getting the fin final leading order correct. So, okay, so we can show that the regret bound is going to be um, essentially bounded by these two terms, where the fine grained bonus terms, which are usually smaller, we need to sum up it for all the iterations. And the cruder bonus term, which is sometimes larger, we only need to sum up them up for a few number of iterations, depending on the size of T prime. So just recall T, is the number of total iteration or trajectories. T prime is the bad trajectories where we also use the FT2 information in the explorations uh, policy. So then we can essentially plug in the definition, sorry, plug in the expression of our bonus terms for T1 and T2 and use some cauchy schwartz inequality to bound each terms individually. So, for here, we are using cauchy schwartz inequality, and then the second term is bounded by uh, the summation of the generalized eluder dimension of each function class FH, uh, which is basically due to the definition of our generalized eluder dimension property. And the first term, because we have shown that T prime is actually on a very small, on a much smaller order compared with T. So we can show that it is actually bounded by T over H times the log, a log covering number of the bonus function class. Then we are able to show that this is essentially on the order of log times function, uh, a log covering number of function class F times TH times D. So this is for the second term. We basically can control it because T prime is on a very smaller size. And for the first uh, term, we also apply the cauchy schwartz inequality, which essentially boils down to the summation of the variance term and the summation of this uh, main one DFH square term. And this term is again bounded by the summation of the dimension just because of our definition. And the first term, the summation of the variance is bounded by essentially T, which is due to the fact that we are exploring the entire space using FT1, and this is approximately the variance of FT1. So using the fact that um, the summation of the reward, we are in the sparse reward setting, we can show that the summation of the variance propagating in all iterations, in all rounds, is also only sum up uh, to one, to a constant for each edge, and then summing them up over t gives a factor of t without any dependence on edge. However, uh, our variance is only upper estimate of the true variance, and this upper estimation will be bounded by this additional term of FT2 minus FT minus two, which is essentially the arrow of our estimation. 
And those terms also contribute to the final, when we are bonding the final regret. However, we can essentially show that the summation of these uh, difference terms is going to be bounded by uh, something that depends on uh, the difference of our optimistic function and the true value function plus ut, which is the threshold we pick, plus bt1 and plus bt2, and also plus the t prime, which is the bad iterations, times the horizon length h. So essentially for all these terms, we can show that they are on a lower order of t, so they only sum up to poly dh square root t. And that is also answers the Dave's question earlier about why we can use uh, only unweighted regressions a variance estimate for the variance estimate because they essentially only sum up to lower order. And these terms only sum up to lower order in terms of t because first of all, due to our choice of ut, so that each is on the order of one over square root t and them summing up will be a square root capital T. And also due to the bound of t prime, which is, on the, which is smaller than t over h due to our second key lemma, and also due to a self-recursion argument, because you can see that the rest of the terms are essentially the same as, as the, in the regret bound. So you can show that the regret is smaller than something plus the regret plus all these additional terms, and then you solve the equation and then you can show the regret. These terms are always bounded by this. So summing these up all together, this gives the total regret bound on the order of log f times thd plus some additional lower order terms. For example, we may have a t to the one fourth term, and then you may use some uh, AMGM inequality to absorb it in the for leading order term, and then some additional poly hd term. So this is how we obtain our main regret uh, bound. Okay, so this is the full analysis. I'm sorry if I lose a lot of you, but we can discuss more details if you are interested. And finally, I just want to mention a few more technical components in our work. Basically, I didn't mention how we compute the bonus at all here, but essentially for the linear, we can directly compute and the complexity class of the bonus term is going to be on the order of d square. And for the nonlinear case, we can use some online data subsampling uh, strategy in previous work and show that the bonus class can be reduced to a log covering size that depends on the maximum of the generalized eluder dimension for each of the function class fh. And then we also need to separate in high complexity function class to lower order terms, where when we are analyzing the variance, we are essentially not really looking at the variance, but separating into two terms, the variance of the true opt uh, function and the variance of the difference term. And then when we are coming up with the variance estimates, the actual variance estimate we use is more complicated than the thing I mentioned in this talk, which is basically due to the fact that we also need to lower bound it by a threshold of alpha. And also we need to have additional terms in the variance estimate to deal with the high complexity of this ft minus f star function, which leads to additional terms in the variance estimate. Okay, so those are the additional technical points. Happy to talk more about any of them. And finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the open problems that our work has pointed to. So first is definitely for relaxing our assumptions. So the condition of this realizability under Bellman backups is usually pretty strong. How to relax this assumption, but still be able to get a model-free algorithm is an interesting open question, I guess. And also there is this generalized eluder dimension condition how to uh, propose comparable alternatives to the standard eluded I mentioned, as we discussed, is an interesting thing to understand better. And uh, there are also the interest in getting uh, better lower order dependence 
or getting a more fine-grained first-order regret guarantees. For example, can we target at a regret bound that looks like this for the nonlinear case? And also there is the question of achieving the pure horizon-free bound for time homogeneous MDP, where the regret bound will scale uh, completely, the leading order term will scale completely independent of the horizon size edge. And this is, as we mentioned, not achievable in the time inhomogeneous setting, but how to achieve this in the time homogeneous setting, it also turns out to be a non-trivial follow-up question. Like you, you cannot just directly extend our techniques, but may need a little bit more uh, study onto this particular case. So those are the open directions. And thank you very much for joining with me for this talk today. So now I'm happy to take more questions and discussions. Thank you very much for your talk, Yuja. Thanks for super interesting. And I really liked the various weighted estimator via the bounds. That's a neat idea. I guess I'll start off with a question of your algorithm seems to critically depend on this sequence UT. To what extent can we misspecify UT? Because I'm slightly worried if you gave me any function class that's outside of linear, I would have no idea what this generalized eluded dimension is. And so I'd be unable to set UT. How rogue do things go? That's an interesting question. Let me quickly think about it. So I think essentially, so I think so essentially, the UT affects the final regret bounds in two ways, the summation of UT and also the size of T prime. The summation of UT is always fine as long as you have the UT to go with order one over square root T. For the T prime uh, size, there is a pretty, yeah, I think there is a pretty um, delicate analysis we do in the sense that for the particular UT we choose, we can guarantee that T prime is going to be smaller than something. But I also feel that if we have UT to be even, let me think, if we have UT to be even larger than that, then we will have the T prime to be even better. So if we have a pretty pessimistic bound of UT, that only harms the lower order term, but it can get the same leading order behavior. I see. Okay. Uh, do we do we have any idea what this generalized eluded dimension behaves like? Have you worked it out for any function classes that are not linear? No, I honestly don't know what is the right function class to look at. So if you have an idea that you may suggest, I'd be happy to check that out. I guess for me the trivial thing to look at would be how does it behave in sort of RKHSs? Because that very tends to be a direct relationship between the linear dimension, which sort of the corresponding effective dimension is linear again. And uh -huh. then as you, yeah, in terms of the behavior of the eigenvalue DK, at least that's for me an intuitive way of looking at I how see. complex a function class is. I see. I would imagine the behavior should be pretty similar to standard eluder dimension, but I don't I don't really yeah, I don't really know for sure. And yeah, maybe we can try it out for the for the class you have mentioned. Okay, do we have any other questions? Please do just speak up. I did have a question uh, about lower order terms. If you take yeah. uh, linear MDP uh, as a specific example, have you looked into how the lower order terms de depend on the H and T? We and have for the, example, the if you... Yes, we have the lower order term for the Yes, we have the lower order term in our paper. Okay. I don't remember it on top of my head. I the think- specific question I, I have, because it's like for the finite time case, right? If T is small, then maybe the lower order term would terminate if you have really high parts of D and H there. 
I think d to the six times h to the fifth is our lower okay. order term. I think we didn't. So I think we didn't really try to optimize the lower order terms. And there are certain things that we know in previous work could um, make the lower order term better that we didn't do. I remember there is this, um, I don't remember the name, but essentially there is a recursive argument that people need to do that has like first estimate the higher order and then to the second order and then to the first order in one of the previous work. Right, and right. at some point, we think that could be potentially helpful for getting better lower order term. Because uh, th this way it's like for small t, you're not really matching the lower bond. Yes. MVPs, yes. But, not, not really, yeah. yeah. Okay, I so, think yeah. I think another reason we have that lower order term is basically because we have this like square root t dependence when we are summing all the ut up mm -hmm. and like which basically leads to a t to the one fourth term with poly d inch and then when you're just naively applying amgm inequality then that poly d h term all gets squared like because we want mm -hmm. to make the one fourth to be square root t and that also contributes to a bunch of high order terms mm -hmm. and I think Tom, Alec, and I discussed at some point that we think to, in order to remove this and get better lower bound dependence, we do need to use that like recursive argument about, I, I don't remember the name of that approach, but like first estimating the higher order and then recursively mm -hmm. going to the second order and then first order mm -hmm. estimates of the function, conditional expectation. Mm -hmm. And then potentially that could give you a better argument. I guess the main question is whether the algorithm would need to be modified for this or maybe the tuning of UT or something like that. Or the algorithm is good as it is, uh, just the I analysis. Think the algorithm, I think the algorithm needs to be modified a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think as Dave has mentioned, one way you could think of to improve the algorithm is for example, if you, get better variance estimate through a recursive argument. You know what I mean? Right now, we only get a variance estimate from the unweighted regression. Yeah. And we are using that variance estimate in the final in the final bounds. But what I'm thinking is that maybe you can, if you can get a more fine-grained variance estimate through some uh, weighted regression, but the variance is not as good, and then you have this like recursive update to get the good variance, then potentially those ki types of things will be beneficial for improving the regret. But I do think that will make the algorithm very complicated, which is probably one way we didn't do it because the current algorithm is already pretty complicated. So it, it's, it's, I would say this and also in the open direction, I mentioned like getting first order regret bonds, I think may potentially require similar types of like techniques. Yeah, I just want to make comment here. Yeah, so the current algorithm won't do that, won't have uh, the lower that disappear just because you just said, because there is a unweighted uh, variance estimation that will show up is uh, T one fourth. And that one you, 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 you cannot get rid of. So you have to do something else, either recursive uh, there's uh, the other technique, I think, uh, in uh, in the other paper, uh, Chen Chen Gu and uh, his students' paper, they do uh, they use uh, rare switching, so that, that that also has some potential. Yeah, so that that's a uh, that's a different argument when they do that. Uh, yeah. Does so, rare switching might help for that? Because I thought rare switching is only helping i mean if you look at their paper they also have high hd dependence right 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 uh, i'm thinking that, that that also has a possibility to try to uh, work out something about the lower order but uh, yeah still you know you one need to do something yeah right. even in that case. Okay. yeah okay thanks okay. Can, I ask a yeah. can i ask you a question if i understand correctly all of these are bounds on the regret right am i correct Yes. But I also was under the understanding that uh, traditionally bounds have been fairly loose in the sense that when you apply the algorithms, they actually seem to be doing them the bound. 
And is that the case as well with your algorithm? Sorry, I don't think I fully understand the question. Traditional algorithms have what property? I mean, usually bounds are associated with an algorithm, right? You, you generate an algorithm in order to generate a bound, right? Uh-huh. So if I understand the holy grail in this business is that the bounds that traditionally have been obtained were in fact crude in the sense that if you were to actually run the algorithm, you would actually do better than what the bound tells you. Because the bounds are in a sense, they're essentially always taking a maximalist position. Otherwise you wouldn't have a bound. So then my question to you is that, okay, here we are shaving little by little, right? We're going from an HT to a square of HT to, to whatever else you, you achieved. In order for you to achieve this, you gave a complicated uh, roundabout way of obtaining a bound under a particular algorithm. And so my question is, were I to actually use that algorithm, would the bound be tight or would it be actually quite loose? And therefore, leading to the natural question that we are still far from getting to the Holy Grail. I think the, yeah, I think I, I feel like I might understand what you're asking. I think the bound is, I think, okay, depending on whether you're asking for so first of all, I guess we are claiming our bound is tight for the linear case, which is shown by the lower bound. If you're asking about um, worst case guarantee versus average case guarantee, is that the question you're asking? Well, it wasn't clear to me which one you were talking about in your uh, talk. Uh, I was talking about the worst case, right? Like the... Mm -hmm. So if it's the worst case, I presume that if you were to run the algorithm, maybe not on a linear uh, situation, that it would necessarily do well, right? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. All right, that's I all mean, I wanted this to know. Is... Okay, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I, I hear you. So this is the, yeah, the boundary show is like the worst case guarantee. I don't really know, like in comparison to the, Simpler algorithms, I don't really know in uh, simpler instances which one might do better. I feel like that's a, either an empirical question or a different part that we want to understand about the problem. I think because in my experience, like when we are getting optimal for the hard instance, it doesn't necessarily mean for the simpler problems, our algorithm may definitely perform better as well. So that is, uh, yeah, that is a different part we need to understand. Just based on the complexity of the algorithm, I wouldn't say this is the natural candidate that people want to use in practice when they're running on different, different types of different types of problems. But yeah, the main selling point we want to emphasize today is that it does get the optimal regret bound for the hard instance in M linear MDP. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And, and by the way, uh, having said that, maybe you could have gone to that conclusion through a different analysis focusing directly on the linear case. Uh, I agree. I think, um, uh yes so basically what we do is we try to analyze the nonlinear case and have linear case as a special case for getting optimal in the linear case probably there are simpler methods because for example i think the concurrent work is also like uh algorithmically simpler a little bit than ours but i also believe their algorithm may have potential to generalize to the nonlinear case as well so i don't think there is really that much difference in linear algorithm, like algorithms for linear MDPs and the nonlinear setting that we are looking at here. But doesn't that risk a question that, I mean, the whole field seems to be predicated on this kind of general framework, and then everybody's off to the races to try to get these good bounds on the, on the regret in the general case. 
But given the fact that it's adaptive, given the fact that there are even formulations that you don't even know what the cost is, is this really reasonable to expect that you're going to get something in that level of generality? And perhaps it would be better off to look at subclasses of problems that have a lot more structure on which you could probably obtain better results and more meaningful results, I think. Mm, I think those are both interesting. I mean, this is a philosophical question that I'm not sure if I can answer. Well, I feel like not, experts not, here probably have better say on this. But it's not philosophical because eventually you're going to run, this is going to run in practice, right? I mean, I feel like what people run in practice is, I feel like proposing algorithms for people to run in practice is different from a little bit in terms of flavor than proposing al algorithms that achieve near optimal regret in certain various settings. Or like understanding there is an algorithm that can achieve a near optimal regret and then try to further simplify it is also another way of like getting uh, empirically practical algorithms. So I, so I still think like understanding this part is important. Yeah, but I suspect that the simplification will be problem dependent. Um, I hear you. I think, I think, I think those are two different efforts, right? Like getting a good pessimistic bound for the general class versus getting very simple and nice algorithm for special class. I feel like those are like different efforts that may be both of interest. No, they're definitely of interest. But if I look at, for example, the area of stochastic control where I started my career, I think that if you look at the general theory where you solve, let's say, MDPs or where you solve, uh, you know, basically all kinds of uh, control problems, even in the in the stochastic sense, it's clear that what you do in the general theory has fundamentally very little to do in solving, for example, the LQG. The LQG mm -hmm. you can solve by simply completing the square. So mm -hmm. in a way, to kind of build, build this enormous theoretical apparatus and then to only implement an LQG, I have to say that if I'm the student in the back of the room, I certainly raise an eyebrow, right? And that's yeah. really I think, the analogy that I'm trying to make here, right? I don't yes. really know what are the kinds of problems that are, people think are the LQG of today. For <laughs> me, right? I, mean, uh, I think that will, I would be interested in learning that too, if ah, okay. experts okay. here would have a say. <laughs>